In this episode, my friend Barry Dyke and I discuss his fourth book, a documentary movie that he's going to be a part of, Private Equity and Other Wall Street Shenanigans. Had fun. Hope you enjoy. Thank you for listening. All right. Welcome to the Banking with Life podcast. I'm your host, James Nethery. And you know, I'm always excited when I have guests because they're very exciting. I'm especially excited to have my friend Barry Dyke on. Um, and he's been on before. Those of you who know him, love him and his work. Those of you who don't know him, you have an opportunity to learn who he is, his work, what he has done. Um, and you will enjoy learning about him and his work, I assure you. So he's going to update us. And uh, so we're just going to catch up. Barry Doc, thank you for being here, sir. How in the world are you? Uh, I'm great, James. I'm in New England in the summertime. I live in the ocean, so you can't be, at, at, you know, this is where all the millionaires come during the summertime, so I couldn't be. Uh, it's a it's a beautiful August day here, and so uh, much to be grateful for. And, uh, you know, in, in spite of these crazy times that we have, you know, I live in a beautiful place. And, you know, so, <clears throat> you know, a lot of good things are going on. Uh, but, you know, we're, we're in a, uh, as you know, James, from a... Um, from savings and um, uh, in America, we're, 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 we keep going farther and farther down into the cesspool, you know. And uh, so I'm just trying to uh, put some sunlight on some of this stuff. And uh, it's almost like we're all getting used to it, you know. Uh, and I got to say, for the listeners, you know, Barry and I, we speak uh, quasi regularly and we have great conversations. I wish that we could capture, you know, uh, just you know, uh, impromptu as we have these conversations, because this man is uh, full of information. He's a researcher among researchers. And frankly, you know, uh, you should probably uh, upgrade your security, Barry. I don't know with the I information. I spend a lot of money on IT. Yeah, because uh, <laughs> yeah, because that's uh, I have it's uh, I have I have a lot of moats around my stuff. Um, yeah. That, all right. Yeah. So, no, I'm, I'm well aware of that because I have been you know, attacked, hacked, whatever you want to call it. And, and, and the, you know, so luckily I've got some, uh, uh, some very good IT people and some of the best. And, uh, you know, so I'm very, very grateful. Yeah. So I am well aware of that because um, when I wrote prior, some of the prior books, you know, uh, some of my websites I would, were, were knocked down. Uh, and, um, you know, and uh, so, uh, you know, it's just, uh, it, it's occupational hazard, you know, but, you know, telling the truth, I think uh, it's not just about me, but it's about our children and our grandchildren and, uh, and, 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 uh, and dad, you know, and, and dad, as you know, James is into slavery. Yep. And, uh, and so I think what we got to do is kind of lead people out of Egypt, if you will. Uh, and, and, out of uh, Egypt uh, onto Babylon. Nelson Nash did a, uh, a uh, essay that, that we have available and reprint. I agree. You know, so, you. I just had to get that in there, sir. We are born yeah, into a debt slave construct and unwillingly without knowing that's the way we're introduced into the world today. Yeah. You know, and, and, and I bring this up because, you know, this whole, all this division now, I think it's really caused, I mean, you know, this black lives matter and all this. I'm not saying it's not important. It is. Okay. But I have a lot of good black friends, you know, and we both agree that the real issues are economic issues, okay? And these are the real issues, and and you're not going to hear them in the media. You just you won't hear them. The real issues, the, the, I I think really the biggest issue is economic inequality. That's just me, um, you know, and uh, all this ES and G vesting and all that stuff in, in wildfires. Hey, I, I'm all for it, but the real big issue is the economic inequality, and I think what you're doing. And I salute you is trying to get people more independent and um, out of the, um, as Nelson would say, to succeed from the system. In other words, and stop listening to all the crap that, that is in the dribble from all the cable and, uh, divisions and television sh channels and all that stuff. And just essentially take some time, read a good book, because that's where the best knowledge is. And, um, you know, and, and listen to people who care about it. Um, well, but, let, let me say, look, speaking of good books, the uh, I mean, we met a long time ago, I believe, at a Nelson Nash think tank prior to the Nelson Nash Institute being created. And you were still doing research or putting together your your first book, Pirates of Manhattan. 
Yeah. Um, so I don't know how long ago that was, but it was a long time. Yeah. Uh, 15, then, 16 years ago, if you can believe it. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm not that old. <laughs> I can't believe it. Okay. So then you wrote the second book, Pirates of Manhattan, Road to Serfdom, I believe. Highway, Highway to Serfdom. Serfdom. Yeah. Highway to Serfdom. Yeah. Yeah. And then the third book was uh, Guaranteed <clears throat> Income. And all of yeah. these are available at your website. Yeah. And uh, even at our store, you know, you graciously allow us to. Uh, promote and sell your books and we do um and then we you've been working kind of and you know if i need to edit this out you know you let me know okay that's fine but but you've been working on your fourth book and and i i'm nothing but encouragement uh to get that done and make it happen right but i know you're a busy guy you have lots of clients and you're i mean i understand there's we all have a limited amount of time but you've uh done a lot of work on private equity uh you not just like for your fourth book, but you continually yeah. do a lot of work on private equity. Um, and then and now, so I think that uh, what I, we just talked about before the, you know, cameras came on and the recording, maybe the recording was on Barry and we're going to have some good B roll in the future. But before we turn the cameras on, um, I think you had indicated that you're going to, you're going to, uh, the fourth book is going to be guaranteed income 2.0. 2.0. Yeah. But you're going to add an addendum of yeah, private equity. Yeah. yeah. And this is the whole thing is, is that most people don't, <clears throat> don't understand it, you know, and this, most advisors don't, and God's given me this gift. I understand this stuff. I'm, I'm a nerd, you know, and, and, I, and, um, so and like you're in Texas. Okay. So, uh, but anyhow, private equity is essentially, it's Wall, Wall Street Burbridge for leverage buyouts, which means essentially buying companies with a lot of debt. And it's gone from a kind of a, a small sliver of overall Wall Street business, James, to now a major component of the overall uh, in, uh, investment, I call the asset management industrial complex. So it's gone really from a small component to a huge one. And I think there were like 25 leverage buyout of private equity firms in the 1980s. And today, according to Pregan out of uh, uh, England, I think it's roughly about 6,600 or more private equity firms. Wow. Okay. And so the whole thing is, is that um, and it's because it's all debt-based finance, James, um, there's a, um, it, it's, it's, it's huge. And for instance, you're in the Texas and, I can, and I'll tell you this for, um, uh, it's, it's, it's a matter of fact, something like the teachers uh, retirement system of Texas or the teachers, uh, uh, are huge, huge um, investors in this crap. Yep. Okay, and uh, and the whole the whole business model is really subsidized by the taxpayer because it, it's um, it's based upon debt and carried interest, which which gives the uh, financiers uh, their their profits, if you will, tax and capital gains rates. And if the company blows up, well, it's not my problem; it's someone else's problem. It yeah, socialize people. the losses, privatize yeah. the profits. That is correct. And what's new, right? But they've like it, 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 it's they've upped their game. Yeah. But it's 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 out of control. So um, so I I'd been researching this and um, and I found out since roughly uh, the year two thousand, James, roughly about three hundred major corporations have gone bankrupt under this model. Okay. And one of the biggest ones, the, one of the, leg, the biggest leverage buyers of all time, James, was in your the home state of Texas, where everything's bigger in Texas. On course. Um, Energy Future Holdings. I don't know if you remember that. It was called TXU. Uh, yeah, yeah, TXU. Yeah, yeah. Sure, yeah, that's that the was, electric that, provider. That, yeah. <clears throat> that was the one of the biggest. I don't, I don't know. Is that down by you or whatever? But anyway. Yeah, event, absolutely. So that was $47, 48000000000 billion and went bankrupt in 2014. Billion, is 48 a, billion. 48 billion with a B. Golly. Okay. And you have all Wall Street's finest and all this stuff. You know, Let's see, who got who got paid in that deal, right? All the private uh, equity guys? Got paid. Uh, yeah, the attorneys got paid. The attorneys right? got paid. And, that, and that, that's another thing, too, is that uh, I, luckily, I, I get to know uh, this guy, uh, one of the top whistleblowers in the world, Brad Birkenfeld, and, and about five, six years ago, he says, he says, you know, Barry, he says, it's the lawyers who make a lot of them, this money, okay? And, you know, some, he, he was right, and I didn't really see that. Um, for instance, there's the, um, um, it was that, uh, and I was just writing about it this morning, an update in the book is that uh, the law firms make a fortune in this stuff. 
And so we, what we have is these, this massive speculation. And I think one of the big things, James, if, if I had a golden one, I would have them, you know how they always talk about investors on the TV or uh, investors are doing this or investors are doing this in the Wall Street Journal? I think it's, it should be speculators. Absolutely. And if, it's, if they said speculators, it would all make more sense. But, then, but now they, it's a catch-all for investors, and people don't even know what's going on. Yeah, and beyond that, you know, half of these, not half of these, a bunch of these uh, opportunities, right, are they're, they're in people's retirement plans. Just like you said, the, uh, the uh, Teachers uh, Retirement System of Texas, the Teachers Retirement of California, of Canada, you know, we talk about this in a minute. But uh, people, the all-American individual – Trying to just uh, not die broke, yeah. not retire poor. Yeah. You know, they have their quote unquote retirement savings wrapped up in this and don't even know it. They don't even know it. And that's the whole thing. So, this is why, I'm, you know, so I think I told you about it. I'm going to be, a, a, there's a documentary going to be released this fall. Yeah. Yes. It's called The Boomer's Dilemma. Okay. And I'm going to be in it. And um, so I'm very grateful. So, I'm going to be in it. And Ted Bennett, the guy who created the 401k. Yep. And, um, Ted Siddell, one of the top whistleblowers in the country. Uh, Olivia Mitchell, who is one of the top economists at Wharton on retirement income. I mean, she can, can she can sell us with companies how to set up the social security programs. David Babel, um, uh, all these, who is a, a doctorate um, in finance. And then William Sharp. And um, where's my invite? Why was I left out? Okay. <laughs> I don't know. Well, it was a weird thing. The, the weird thing about it is that I, I got this. Uh, uh, email of James about two, three months ago. And uh, I get an email. This, is, this guy emailed says, you don't know me. My name is Doug Orchard, but I'm a documentary filmmaker. And I have some investors uh, from the Western part of the country or Utah, actually, who are, uh, are funding this um, documentary movie called A Boomer's Dilemma. And um, the investor said, if, the, if you're doing a documentary, you have to include Barry Dyke in the movie because of the research I've done. So actually, um, I know I know why I didn't get an invitation. I'm just saying, <laughs> you know. So, but I can't wait to see it, and I'll promote it. You know, I think. If it yeah. Comes so out the, way the whole it's thing to. is really the, the problem is James is that people do not have a retirement income. You know, the vast majority. Now, the thing is, if you do, if you are a government employee, employee, you you you're, you're in, a, in a pretty good shape because what you are getting, James, at, at retirement is an annuity. Yep. It's a defined benefit of a pension is an annuity. So there's really no stress for the for the public sector, but for the for the private sector, it's a big big problem. So one of the the things which we, um, uh, the movie will talk about is um, the research which I've done on this stuff. Isn't it isn't it funny how uh, coincidental uh, you know uh, keep going nothing to see here kind of an attitude, and uh, and what I'm talking about is the disparagement of annuities in the financial world. It's like, oh my gosh, they're the palatra, you know, the high, unbelievable commissions. You're going to lock your money up. You're never going to get, you know, out of it, what you put into it and all kinds of misinformation, disinformation. It's, it's, uh, you know, I, I guess it's really part of the, the culture that we live in. You know, the truth is hard to find today. You, you have to really diligently search for the truth. But I'm just saying when it comes to annuities, which we use annuities in our practice yeah. um, and a private pension plan, who has one of them? What if you're not a government employee? You know, what if you're a private individual, a private citizen? You're the one funding all the government pensions. You're screwed. Yeah. So you're what's screwed. what's yeah. left for you? Social Security and then. Uh, which is an annuity. By the way, Social Security is an annuity. <laughs> exactly. They just don't have any money. <laughs> I mean, I'm just saying. <laughs> um, anyhow, the annuities get a bad rap, and I'm not saying all annuities are good and worth owning. I agree. I, I agree. I agree. So they absolutely should be part of a sound retirement plan. I don't care who you are. And, and this is the whole thing. These all, matter of fact, uh, Moshe Mavilsky, Mavilsky, well, I forget, what, he's one of the top economists in Canada. He's like world renowned. Mm -hmm. He said, I think he's, and I haven't talked to him yet, and I'm, I'm not going to talk to anyone in the movie until after I the movie's released. Mm -hmm. um, and I made this that agreement with the documentary filmmaker, but 
he said one of the only things that economists agree on, he says that economists agree on nothing. And he said they, yeah. none of them agree on much of anything, but they all, all every single one of them agree to use annuities to guarantee income streams. Hmm. So you get some of the best, but, but are you going to hear this in the media? No. Now the whole thing is James is in what is called wall street speak is called Tina. There is no alternative. Okay. All these systematic withdrawal plans and all that stuff, as you know, James, you know, this is a bunch of crap. So one of the only things that works is annuities. And, um, so, um, so, the reason why I'm going to be in the movie, whatever, and this will be in the, in the book when it's up dated, because the last book I put, published in 2015, I found at that time roughly 50 corporations using annuities, large annuities, uh, to finance their pension plans. Okay. Since that time. Yeah, big companies. We're not talking about. Big companies. Yeah, yeah. So some yeah. of them, okay, just kind of give your people a tease. Yeah. Some of the big ones are General Motors, you know. That's spent thirty-one billion <laughs> in annuities in, in the U.S., uh, the United Kingdom, and Canada. Uh, British Airways, uh, Lloyd's Banking Group, Rolls Royce, National Grid, HSBC Bank, Verizon, J.C. Penney, Barclays Bank, Lockheed Martin, uh, FedEx Corporation, Bristol Myers Squibb. Um, so I'm going to be giving all these people. And this is all very, all information from. I get it all from 10Ks. SEC filings, okay, so none of it's, you know... You mean you're not making all this stuff up? No, sir, I wouldn't, I know, I, I you know, <laughs> BMW, you know, break my, you know, break BMW, uh, uh, who's the other, the BBC. Now, this is, this is the greatest, one of the greatest things that which I'll be revealing in, in, in the book is that, um, you know, luckily because the books I've written and so forth, I have, I get to, I've got to know some, some pretty knowledgeable reporters on, on uh, you know, with the journal and uh, the times and other stuff, you know, sure. and, um, you know, and, um, you know, they, I've never heard of them once ever say, hear them say anything good about annuities, but people like uh, the BBC, they bought what's called a longevity swap, which essentially protects their, it's an annuity to protect the longevity of their pension plan. They bought them for 4, 4 billion in, in, in December of, of uh, 2020. Who'd they pay for that? When, you, when they bought it, they bought it. Who'd they buy it from? They buy it, you know, from various, you know, the, um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a bigger trend in the UK than the US because they have more pension plans. It's actually, uh, yeah, <laughs> more socialism. Yeah. <laughs> well, the whole thing is actually, uh, but the you know, World League tables, James, I got one for you because this will be in the book. Um, how do you think uh, America is ranked in terms of retirement systems worldwide in, in the top like 40 industrial companies? What do you think they are in the top 20? Uh, well, let me, so from a, from a, a governmental standpoint, you know, from a social no, an overall system, you know, combination of private and you know, social security type of systems and, and pensions and, and uh, 401ks. Who, who do you think is, who, who, what do you think America, where number one America stands? And yeah, no, I would say that they're, I wouldn't say that they're at the bottom, but they're, they're closer to the bottom than they are the top. We are. Yeah, yeah, we're, we're, yeah, we're, we're, we're almost like a third world com, uh, country uh, at this point. Um, yeah, I think we're, we're right next to Malaysia. No way. <laughs> Malaysia. I could make this stuff up. It's Mercer Pension Index. They're, um, they're, and these are, you got actuaries and, uh, uh, and uh, who are doing this work out of Australia, and they rank the world pension system each year. And so the, the three best are, are uh, the, actually, the Dutch is the, are the best. Um, and then uh, Finland and Israel is number three, believe it or not. Oh, I'm not surprised. You know, so they actually kind of look up, you know, they look out for our people. And so what you what you see, and, and, you know, I guess you could call it socialist, but what I, what I see in some of these other companies is more of a collective sharing of the risk. Whereas in America, you're on your own. You're, not only are you on your own, but they're going to profit from you being on your own. Okay, and there's no better example. Okay, now... You're in, you're near D Dallas, right? AT and T is their headquarters down there, right? Yeah, yeah. Twenty miles south of Fort Worth, Texas, world headquarters of Banking with Life. So, but okay. yes, AT and T. Yeah. Okay. Now, AT and T. Okay, this is this is this will be in, in in the book. Okay, but AT and T is probably they've done um, 
uh, probably the, um, uh, the the probably the two biggest economic emergence and acquisition disasters of, of life. And uh, matter of fact, I'm just going to give people. If you just give me, bear with me, I'm going to give you the data from my habit on my iPad. With my love, my iPad. But um, so hey, let's see. Well, let's see. AT and T. Hang on. So this is the reason why I'm doing this. The smartest guys in the room are not that smart. Um, <laughs> no. you know, we would okay. we would all be shocked at how okay with, with their heart from smart they are. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay, I, 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 I fact check this. Okay, so I'm I'm very confident in all this stuff. So, <laughs> you know, so first of all, there was the AT and T, which is right in your own backyard, James. They they purchased Direct TV. You know, the folks with all the, you know, the, everyone has their satellite dish. Oh yeah, and then you want to bundle all those services. Yeah, 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 we're gonna bundle it. Okay, so in eighteen in two thousand fourteen, AT and T paid sixty seven billion for the satellite operator. Paid sixty-seven billion with a B, okay. But they sold thirty percent of the company in two thousand twenty-one for eight billion, okay. So that means, and then when they sold the a, a, a third of the company to an, another private equity firm, TPG Texas Pacific Group, out of uh-huh. Texas, though, right? and and they only put one point eight billion dollars down in uh, cash, and, and they financed the rest of it with debt. So. AT&T, which is the largest telecommunications company, um, uh, their their stake in um, in uh, Directv is now sixteen point two five billion. Now this is over five years when they paid sixty seven billion with a B. Okay, <laughs> they, so Directv lost 64 percent of its value. Okay, but there's more. And AT and T, they purchased Time Warner. I don't know if you remember this one, James. Okay, I, I can't keep up with it so much because the bankers love the mergers and acquisitions because they make so much in fees. But right. So uh, AT and T bought eight, um, uh, bought Time Warner uh, for eighty five billion. All right. And for that, doing that deal, three uh, AT and T executives uh, who shepherded the deal, John Stevens, David McAtee, and John Stanky received $9 million in bonuses to complete this merger, okay? And, um, you know, so the thing is, is that that one lost, I don't know, uh, it, it's it, it's just incredible what a disaster is, but that lost uh, 30, 40 billion, okay? <laughs> now, now Stanky, one of the guys who uh, was not the CEO of AT&T, and people out there, Fact check it. Don't take my word for it. So they promoted him after losing 30, oh, 40 billion. Yeah, they promoted him. <laughs> the bonus, okay? Yeah. But the attorney, we're talking about attorneys, get a $5 million uh, bonus, okay, in 2019, okay? So this is just a couple of years ago. And, um, uh, but now get this, but get this. There's more. When St- uh, when Stanley, uh, Randall Stevenson, the CEO of ATT, when he retired, James, you know what he got for a monthly annuity income? Uh, no, no telling. Two million a month, three million a month. Two no, million. but two hundred seventy-four thousand a month. Oh, rest okay. Guaranteed for the rest of his life, an annuity. So what's so bad with that? So, so this, you know, these are this kind of kinds of things that we're seeing, you know, going on. And you know, don't take my word for it. Uh, you know, we have Google. Thank you, God. We still have it for now. Um, but so we, this is the type of types of thing. So people say annuities bad, but you know, Stevenson who just blew up this company with two horrible mergers, walked away with two hundred thirty four grand a month. Where do I get myself one of them? All right, <clears throat> that's just an annuity income. I bet that he's got other perks. Oh yeah, they they, get, they make hundreds of millions in, in options and RSUs and all that stuff. So yeah, exactly. so you know so a lot of so what I'm going to kind of bring in some of the the smartest guys in the room are, are not that smart and. Uh, uh, and uh, and so this is what's continuing to go on, you know. You know the. Uh, I think I think we brought this up like in the life insurance business, the uh, the private it was a hedge fund private equity group out of Canada, all involved in the Canadian yeah. retirement system, buys a hundred and something year old life ins- mutual life insurance company out of a. Uh, Ohio I don't I don't want to name names without a Cincinnati, Ohio. <laughs> yeah. And uh 
I think they're the last I looked, they're about a forty billion dollar company, and and I'm sure there's been lots of press releases, but I seen one press release, one of the early ones, that said they're going to allow five hundred million to uh, for the interested parties, right? So. And yeah, so, but, that, but you read read between the lines and change on that. Well, they, they bought between they bought that company for nothing. Yeah, it was two exactly. Canadian um, um, pension plans, the Ontario Teachers and uh, the Casas de Depot de Quebec. You know, they they uh, they their Montreal counterpart, and they hired, of course, a, a, a private equity manager out of New York called Const- Constellation Brands, or whatever. Yep, yep. Um, and they purchased um, Ohio National. Uh, Really on the cheap, um, and I actually know some CEOs actually looked at the company. They they passed because of the yep. the annuity exposure. I mean, they get themselves in, into quicksand and guaranteeing these um, what do you call it the um, income uh, riders gar- guaranteed lifetime income withdrawal benefits. Okay, they, yep. so they get with it with the variable product, which is stupid. But any event, um, <laughs> stupid. But Wall Street loves it. Okay, right. so um, so they get over the head on that and. Um, so that and so that's what uh, would happen. But they they bought the company I, uh, uh, for really for only about a hundred million dollars down, and they said in the press releases an additional five hundred million in equity. But it's staged over like over five, next four or five years, so they really got it for nothing. Exactly. So, but those guys that ran that company got a bunch of bonuses. Guarantee you. I haven't, I haven't seen that one yet, James. You know? I haven't seen that either. I'm, you know, I don't know that. I've just been paying attention for the last 50 something years. What's going on? Um, but my point here is that they're going to buy out the mutual life insurance company is owned by the policyholders, right? So yeah. they're going to be purchased. They have to be purchased. They have to be compensated, right? So, so the company is going to demutualize so they can be sold. So they can be purchased by the private equity firm out of Canada. Yeah, and they're, yeah, and then and they're going to compensate them. I don't know with what, but they're going to well, allow yeah, five hundred million dollars out of a forty million uh, billion dollar company. It's like, oh my gosh, talk about uh, poor math. You know, somebody's winning in that, and it's not going to be the policyholders, in my opinion. No, it's not. But the thing is, they're, they're going to be better protected than they were in something else. You know, um, uh, than they are in a mutual fund. Okay. Now- well, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's, <laughs> that's you know that's the whole thing you have to which we have to look at is that uh, <clears throat> you know I don't like private equity getting into the business but because um, the no, and then look at all the reserves that they have they're going to practice a, they're going to practice banking they're going to leverage all the assets and then they're going to take these beautiful wonderful dividend paying whole life products off the market and then they're going to either write annuity business or they're going to write universal life business because they can get a higher rate of return. Right on that block of business, so I get the idea of capitalism and and uh, profits, but it gets pretty dang convert perverted whenever it develops into this crony capitalism and this you know debt based purchasing. It's a uh, it's 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 just an expansion of the cesspool, and I think that the cesspool is bleeding off into you know legitimate industries like the life insurance business. Yeah, which is, which is sad. It's the um, there was actually. Um um, Bob Castellone taught me I don't know, the, the founder of Leap Systems, and he was the guy who really um, made me understand this. It was called Gresham's Law. You familiar with that one, James? Yeah, I have to go back in my memory. Gresham's Law. But yeah, that's when essentially when bad, bad money, money. Pushes, yeah, bad money, which I consider private equity in Wall Street, pushes <laughs> yeah. out good. Yeah, and you know that's so, exactly that's exactly what's and going this is on. exactly what's happening. So if you're with a good mutual company, good mutual holding company, and there are some good uh, good public companies, and there's actually some very good, uh, there's a very large uh, family-held life company down in uh, Moody, Texas, or whatever it is, yeah. uh, which is a very well-run company, okay? Um, you know, people actually, they're, they actually have some integrity. They actually, you know, you know who, they, who they are. They're huge, okay? And they, they, have, they run the business with a lot of integrity. Um, and, and there's some public companies, life companies, which I'm not going to mention any names, uh, which which do a really good job. And the mutual companies, I think really what we, we have to do, James, now more than ever, okay, and it's coming to this anyhow, is that we have to insulate people from this, this Wall Street cesspool. 
you know, and, and I'm, I'm a capitalist, you know, I'm an RIA, I, I manage money for people and stuff like that. But I think you really, uh, and this is the point of the book and one uh, the point of the movie is that, hey, you know, if you come in retirement, you really want to have an income stream for the rest of your life, you know, and you can do that with one or two projects you can do with annuities or life insurance. That's it. That's it. There isn't anything else. You know, and, and so the whole thing is that in the hypocrisy, James, is just incredible. So uh, uh, I get kind of give people, your your listeners, just kind of a taste of what's going to be happening. Um, so one of the things which I kind of freaked out is that um, uh, the, uh, I have these notes here. I like this. I'm a, te- I'm, I'm a caps, by the way. I love my uh, technology, but, um, <laughs> you know, um, but yeah, the, uh, the media companies who, who I, I will verify, um, and it was all 10 K stuff, uh, CBS, you know, uh, uh, the, the television networks bought a huge annuity. The New York times has never said a damn good word about anything about annuities or life insurance. Uh, I think bought about 460 million in annuities, Thompson Reuters, uh, pension fund, H Bellow, McClatchy, Scripps, Crane, Crane Navigation. Scripps. Yeah. Scripps, yeah, Scripps, Bonham, uh, Graham Holdings, which is the old Washington Post. Even like Comcast. I mean, the, the largest owner of life insurance in the world was um, was uh, Ralph Roberts. He died. How much so, did he own? Do you know? Uh, right about uh, 460 million bucks, James. I don't know. <laughs> so obviously it was spread all around. Yeah, yeah. But this is, you know, so... Uh, again, you know, you're never going to hear anything um, from the media. And, you know, and uh, and one of the things which I'm going to talk about, they have in the film, we kind of give them a, a, my experience of being interviewed with Bloomberg about a decade about some of this research. So people, when they, when they see the movie, um, they'll see, you know, what I went through and and, um, uh, and it was never published. And actually, they, I had kind of the same experience uh, with CNBC. Yeah. And... Um, um, I was referred very, let me just put a very well-known authority on some of this stuff. And uh, I was laughed at, but I didn't realize at the time that at the time GE owned uh, CNBC and NBC. And you know who one of the largest subprime mortgage uh, uh, managers to blow up in, in uh, 2007 was James? GE Capital. Close man. Well, part of GE Capital, WMC Mortgage. Warehouse, the old Warehouse Mortgage Corporation. Yeah. So when CNBC is reporting all these mortgage stuff, oh, look at how terrible this is. They were actually part of the you know, part of the crime. <laughs> yeah. So. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So yeah. So so at the time, yeah, they lost like a billion. They borrowed from Apollo Global, and then they <clears throat> for like five hundred million in two thousand four, and then in two thousand seven, the thing exploded. They lost a billion dollars. <laughs> Then last year, 2018, whatever, uh, they settled with the Justice Department for like 1.4 billion or something like that for the fines with WMC mortgage. Then, like a, a good Wall Street tactic, all lawyered up, they threw it overboard into bankruptcy with like 100 grand in it. So can't go get them in anymore. So this is so this is you know so this is the kind of things w- which the consumer has to uh, uh, you have to look behind the scenes. But if people are, you know, are with a good mutual company or, you know, some of the good uh, uh, publicly traded life companies. And there are some good ones. Um, sure. That's why they have to come to people like you and me, you know, to, to know who they are. Um, they're going to be fine. Um, you know, and, um, you know, and uh, we really need to insulate people from that. But the problem is, is that, as you know, private equity is getting into the life space, which is, It's it's like inviting Lucifer for dinner, you know. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's what's happening. What? Where is that going to go? What do you? What do you? What do you? Not to be a you know a fortune teller or a prognosticator, but um, you know what is uh, what do you what do you think the future in the financial footprint looks like in America? Um. Well. Um, you know, that's why James. I'll tell you, I don't know. Um, right. That's why I read the. That's why I read the Bible every morning, and um, and I do it pretty diligently because I need strength. People are gonna need spiritual strength uh, because um, 
you know, corruption is some, as old as man. There's nothing, nothing new, nothing new under the sun. Right. But, for the, but, but to the level we're seeing now with no accountability is, is incredible. So the best we can do is really help, you know, our, our, our people we love and we care about, you know, and, you know, and if you know, if you, you know, and, um, and if you uh, at least a portion of it, if you put money into save money into things like, you know, whole life insurance and annuities and things like that, people can't get hurt. Yeah. They can't get hurt. Yeah. You know, I, I agree with that. I think that, uh, and I don't know, you know, I don't know the future. The future is unknown. I sure don't know it. But, uh, you know, you look around in Europe, all of the mutual companies have gone by the wayside. They've all demutualized, you know, um, when it comes to investment advice and, <clears throat> and uh, commission salespeople, you know, commissions are a bad word. Salespeople, sales, salesmanship, salespeople are, you know, uh, made out to, you know, they're demonized. You know, it's derogatory to be a salesperson. So they've limited the pay. They've limited the uh, the uh, people that can offer financial products. And I think that some variation. I think that's the future of America. You know, just like uh, big government has taken over health care, they've taken over education, you know, they've taken over, uh, you know, education, yeah, you know, in health care. And, and I think they're going to take over the financial services industry as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I, I make an analogy is like, um, uh, with like hardware stores, you, you'll be able to go to any hardware store you want as long as it's Lowe's or Home Depot. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And, that, and that's, <clears throat> but I go to local hardware store, James. I love it. And the people are so kind and hopeful and they'll have stuff, you know. I they're still knowledgeable. In my, you know, the real estate is probably worth more than the business is okay at this point. But sure. they're just, the people are so nice. And, you know, and, and you go to Home Depot, it's like, oh, yeah, yeah. And the service with Home Depot, try to get, you know, you know, they sub out this to sub out to that to sub out to this. But this is where it's all going. I mean, I, I bought a refrigerator from Home Depot, you know. And I tell you, James, what a freaking nightmare. A Chinese you know, distributor. Just, <laughs> you know, and, you get that, and, and the poor saleswoman who, who sold it to me, it's like she didn't want to be fine because there was no follow up on anything. There's no love and caring in any of this stuff. So I think, that, I think uh, as advisors, um, you know, I love writing books and all thing, but I still, you know, uh, most of my income comes from advising and, you know, all that other stuff. Um, you know, if you're going to really love and care about people, you, people have to know the truth. But the, the service now is just horrific. It's just horrible. I mean, I think about it. I had a, um, uh, my assistant's out in Colorado right now, so I had to take care of something with Verizon. Verizon said, we're going to shut off your phone. And I had to cancel. Luckily, with the online banking you now, I checked all this. Look, at you guys, you've paid I know you paid. I have to cancel checks here. You paid all this stuff because you know, now we're having everything automated, which is good. Be, um, but you know how hard it was to get to speak to an operator, in Verizon. Oh my gosh! <clears throat> you know I got to be careful what uh what I want to say. I got to be careful what I say. Did they speak English? Barely. Yeah, the King's English. <laughs> you know, I don't know. Yeah, um, I, I'm in the Philippines, or you know, I'm in. Uh, yeah. Haiti or, Haiti or whatever the whole thing is not Haiti, but Dominican. And so it's, it's fairly, um, you know, it's like I had the serious XM, you know, uh, music service yeah. and James, I, I, I surrender. It's like, you know, the, 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 this service is the worst. Yeah. And I love it at the end of at, at the end of those phone calls. Then they upsell you on the next package. They try to so they do that all the all the time. My wife has to deal with all that, right? Because um, I, I, my, I don't have the patience or the tolerance, right? Yeah, yeah. So they up they try to upsell every time the horrific service, and they can't correct it. They won't correct it, or they can't get off their script, you know. And then they upsell. Or make an effort to upsell. I mean, what? Who does that? You know, and the financial companies are doing that now. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> That's yeah. True. Was it Robin Hood? Was it Robin Hood? They just went public this week. They don't even have a phone number. <laughs> yeah, people that was, people they don't even have a phone number, and this is what people are going to. Yes. Oh my gosh. I. Uh, it's been a. It's been a. A minute, but. You know, I read the articles on that, how it was going public and what they expected the IPO to be. Do you, what Update us on that. What what happened there? Well, they went public this week and it was um, um, 
part uh, a direct listing where they sold directly to the public because they, they had 13 million users. I mean, uh, you know, they, they, Wall Street just made a fortune. They made so much freaking money during the whole pandemic. You know, and this uh, I was I, I'm I, I'm all familiar with all this stuff now. They made a fortune. Okay, the private equity guys, the bankers, the lawyers, everyone made a fortune during this whole thing when people were losing their jobs. Yeah. And so this whole IPO market. Listen to this one, James. Do you know there was more initial public offerings in 2020 than it was in the 99. 2000.com meltdown? No. No. Yeah, yeah we've, we've, we've crossed the Rubicon. So it, it's worse than it was in 99. Yeah, but the market's up 20% year over year, you know, for a couple of years, 20, 25%. So what could go wrong, Barry? It's all going one way. I'm buying Strasse, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. And so, yeah, so this is the whole thing. And, you know, the, and the, the media controls the narrative, you know. And, you know, there was one thing which <clears throat> I the, <clears throat> my information technology guy, uh, brought to my attention this week and he was in helping me do some stuff with the book. Uh, very smart guy. Brilliant. And um, the media is, is just done, done a horrific job. Um, uh, now, the thing is, I subscribe to the Financial Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, the New York Times, Bloomberg, Financial Times, you name it. I get them all. A lot of them digital now. Did you ever hear about the the demonstration about the um, the coal miners in New York City this past week. Uh, yes, the union. They were union. Yeah, uh, I didn't know. I wasn't for me with the union. Okay, but yeah, it was in Alabama. But you know, well, what it is? They bought the uh, BlackRock, and you know, it was the usual suspects: BlackRock, yeah, yeah. Vanguard, State Street, Infidelity. Okay, were the major shareholders of the company. Essentially, when they buy these companies out of bankruptcy, the union they can essentially change the benefits. So. Um, you know, I'm, I'm more I get to know on certain unions, people actually need this stuff to insulate them. Yep. So but to make a long story short, I didn't hear about any of this stuff until someone brought it to my attention. And this has been going on. And I think they've been on strike since April. And, you know, so I think, you know, the uh, you know, I I'm a capitalist. OK, but the I think the, we, we've kind of forgotten our um, um, what's good for the little guy. So. My point is, you have a major strike, they were, but they were demonstrating across uh, 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 right in front of BlackRock, which is now the largest asset manager in the world, yeah. thanks to the U.S. taxpayer, which yeah. we're, we funded out the the purchase of uh, uh, Barclays Bank index funds uh, uh, with the Bank of America and PNC Bank. Okay, so we, the taxpayer, made BlackRock the giant that it is today, and uh, we didn't hear any about this in, in the in the press. Yep. Now you heard about it just, be, but it, this has been going on for a while. But I didn't hear anything about it. Uh, no, I seen uh, some somewhere on social media. Um, you know, I seen them, and now that you mentioned it, they were outside of BlackRock. But I had no idea of what you know that they were coal miners in uh, from Alabama. Yeah, I, I did not know that. But so BlackRock took over the company and now they're going to shred their yeah, benefits. Yeah, they, they, that's what us last time Wall Street is you know, buy it out of bankruptcy. Mm -hmm. And this is what I'm, I'm getting into in, in the book is that what they'll do is they'll buy a company like, uh, and I get into uh, not to uh, like something like Hostess Bakeries, you know, Twinkies, Wonder Bread, yeah, Yo Yo's, yeah. Ding Dong. Bimbo, baby. Yeah. Uh, that went through two. Uh, they've been through several bankruptcies. They went bankrupt around 2009, um, and then um, they dumped the pension benefits onto the uh, Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation. It was yeah. taken private by Riverwood Holdings and Tim Collins, who was friends with Barack Obama. Okay, they ended up going to bankruptcy again, uh, and then they so all the pension benefits were dumped in onto uh, the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation. Which they're kind of polluting the pool, James. You know, and sure. and, uh, um, and and so then uh, Apollo and uh, and um, Dean Metro Metropolis, the guy who used to own Pops Brewing, they took over a hostess in a in a um, in another leverage buyout. They levered it up. They put he put a billion dollars more debt in the balance sheet. Pull out nine hundred million dollars. and They flip it again to another private equity SPAC. So this is the stuff that's going on right now. It's like you and I can't do this. And, you know, yeah. most people can't do this. But if you're, you know, you're the elite financiers, whether, the, you know, in the UK, it's just as bad. Yeah. Didn't a Mexican company wind up with that hostess or no? 
No, I mean, I used no to I'm thinking of Baird's. No, no, I'm thinking of Baird's, Mrs. Baird's. I'm sorry. But so, uh, so this, but this is the whole thing. So it gets flipped over so many times. And uh, uh, but, yeah, so I'll, I'll get into people. So one, one of the things which I'm trying to get people is that they are really better off dealing with people like the James, James Netheries of the world or, you know, like our friend you know, Doug Jones out there. Hi, Doug, if you listen to this and uh, I agree. Uh, he, he listens. Really, Come on, Doug. We love you. Sorry yeah, so, you're not here. He's probably on vacation somewhere. Yeah, so uh, or running or whatever. He, he's, a, he's a wonderful guy from the South. Uh, but uh, Dalton, Dalton, Georgia. But uh, there's, so there's a lot of really good people like yourself out there, James. And I'm trying to help people, essentially trying to help um, the, the end consumer, guys like yourself. And actually, the life companies, you know, some of the ones that you and I represent, they've actually done a pretty good, they've actually, and I, I'll have as many complaints as anybody about them, but when you look at the end of the day, they've actually been, a, they've been pretty good stewards. Yes. You very know? good. Yep. And where is question? Yeah. You know, I know a long time ago that uh, was actually in 2008, I'm working with a, a young agent, you know, and just uh, kind of mentoring him and educating him on the inner workings of life insurance construct policies and different oh. things. And, and uh, this was probably in 2009 or 10. I love that. I love that Lehman Brothers risk management. Risk problem. management problem. <laughs> oh, by the way, by the way, get, get this. Get this. Lehman Brothers dumped its pension plan on, on the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation. No way. And Lehman Brothers, yeah, Lehman Brothers dropped its pension plan onto the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation. We don't believe you folks. Google PBGC, Lehman Brothers. Yeah. And you get this. <clears throat> and you know what Lehman Brothers in the UK bought did with their pension risk, James? No. What'd they do? They bought an annuity for a billion bucks. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Look, Lehman Brothers, that, that company existed uh, from the 1830s or 40s, I believe. Right? And then when the, that was all going down and a lot went on that people don't know about, um, they were thrown to the wolves, Lehman Brothers. Um, and what's the other? There was, uh, I mean, a, a lot of them went bankrupt in 2008. And, uh, and, the re and here, here's where I was going with that. I think it might have been Lehman Brothers. Do you remember the date they filed bankruptcy? Was it uh, uh, April? I think uh, 2008, $660 billion in debt. You know, like, yeah, it's the largest corporate bankruptcy of all time, I believe. All right. So listen, I'm, I'm working with this young agent. And it was, uh, it, it had to be in 2009, 10 or 11. And I'm going through this um, illustration and just going through the mechanics of a policy. And he tells me, he's like, James, do you see what's significant on that page? And I'm like, well, yeah, I see all the numbers and it's a wonderful thing. He said, no, that policy was issued on this particular date. I want to say it was in April of 2008. And I'm like, okay. He said, that's the day Lehman Brothers went bankrupt. Right now, I could be wrong on the data, is some, but I'm pretty sure it's Lehman Brothers. And I thought, wow! So here we are looking at a at a at an illustration. The policy had performed as good or better than it illustrated, and the illustration was was projecting forward um, from a date that a, a hundred and plus year old company had gone bankrupt and all these other financial institutions were shredded during that time and that was an eye-opener for me you know i'm like wow yeah i never noticed that you know i didn't pay attention to when that policy was issued um but that was significant for me and uh i did not know that lehman brothers dumped all that on the pbgc yes they did and that's that's what i'm putting in the book you know because lehman brothers was one of the lehman brothers folks yeah, Lehman Brothers. Okay, you, okay, was one of the largest uh, issuers or, or syndicators of uh, leverage buyout debt uh, for all these leverage buyouts, and um, which is which is the main accelerant to the current state we're at right now. And and not only that, James, is that when you understand um, on top of that, I don't know. I'm going to tell you if you knew about this, and just kind of giving people a taste of what's going to be in the book. You ever hear of the healthcare tax credit? No, educate us. <laughs> I couldn't believe this. I couldn't believe this. I couldn't believe this. <clears throat> so on top of the being uh, thrown in, throwing into the, um, essentially polluting the, the PBGC uh, uh, risk pool, um, on top of this, 
and companies like uh, like Lehman Brothers or Avaya, and there's a whole bunch of other ones. Um, they people got anyone between the ages of 60, 55 and sixty five, whatever, they get a health care tax credit for seventy two point five percent. I when when I publish the book, it all be in detail. Okay, yeah. but roughly so two through three fourths of their health care premium was subsidized with a tax credit, either directly to the carrier or through the, through the tax returns. So. You know, when Lehman right. Brothers dumped, you know, it was like twenty. There's like twenty three thousand active participants in in the uh, in the Lehman Brothers pension plan. Um, I have the exact numbers, but um, so on top of that, they get a essentially uh, seventy five percent of their health care uh, insurance subsidized. Perfect. Where do I get me yeah. one of them? Well, you got to go to work for the government in some form. Or be being, you know. So this this is the whole thing, and so um, so when when you look underneath the hood, you know, and I'm a small business person like you are, you know, you know, it's just, uh, you know, all these, your payroll costs, your healthcare costs, they're just substantial. Yeah. So, <clears throat> you know, I think it, you know, when Bear Stearns went belly up? Right around the same time. Well, James, they're all leveraged, you know, 30 to 40 to one. Uh, Bear Stearns, you know, and Bear Stearns and actually it was David Stockman who, who, who uh, um, <laughs> you know, the icon who actually we was, he told me personally how Bear Stearns uh, held all the uh, all, all the debt um, for the uh, leveraged buyout of Hilton Hotels. Mm-hmm. And the reason why Bear was essentially married to and a shotgun wedding to J.P. Morgan was because of all that debt. Um, but right around the same time, but they were all they were all levered, you know, 30, 40 to one. And the Germans were, I think, the worst. You know, the Germans, the Germans, yeah, Deutsche Bank and. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but the, see, we had, we had Citigroup were doing, they, you know, leapfrogging by putting entities in, the, in, you know, the Cayman Islands and Isle of Man and so forth. So, but the life companies don't, you know, they don't do that. It's boring, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but one of the, uh, the good things is that, um, I don't know if people have seen this guy and, uh, on the internet. Have you ever heard of a guy by the name of Mike Green? Uh, no, no. I uh, he's the, uh, luckily I've been in touch with him. He, he used to run money for Peter Thiel, okay. and um, I get a mile of the guy's courage. And uh, you know, because most investing now, James, is in uh, passive uh, index funds, whether it be ETFs mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. or um, you know uh, S and P five hundred funds, that type of thing. Now, the thing which which he came up with and is also is actually backed up by the Federal Reserve uh, Bank of Boston is that the problem that um, uh, index funds and ETFs and um, the way they're designed, there is no accountability, James. I call them communist funds because you just give them all your money if they blow up. And this gets back to Lehman Brothers because if um, if you go and read the Pirates Manhattan 2, I would surfing. You know who the major um, uh, investors were in Lehman Brothers were? You know, Vanguard and uh, oh, Fidelity, yeah, yeah. all this stuff. Yeah. So there's no, there's no accountability. You know, and these, you know, uh, you know, fidelity, the technology stuff is very good, but the, um, the there's no accountability. Yeah. Well, the um, did you um, see an article here maybe a month or so ago that Wells Fraudo is closing down lines of credit? Yeah, and they're uh, yeah, yeah. So the thing is, if you if you want to do a leverage buyout, you want to take over a company. They're open for business, but if you're a small business person trying to get a line of credit or something like that, forget it. Yeah, you know, it's like, well, you know, they uh, and I don't, I don't, I don't read everything that they put out, but <clears throat> I did read that they were going to pursue other lending opportunities. Right? I mean, that was their reason for giving, you know, small business owners um, and private individuals sixty days to wrap those lines of credit up. And my question here, do you think that's like a canary in the coal mine? You know, is there something nefarious going on or, you know, more things like that to come? Or is money going to start tightening up? Um, you, have any you know, I, I don't know, James. Um, you know, uh, one, you, one, one thing you, you'll never see any of them get out of is the credit card business because that's so freaking profitable. You know, it's, you know, it's just uh, now since September 2018, there I am. The banks aren't even required to any reserve. So even the fractional reserve, reserve system is thrown out the window. Yeah. So, 
It's um, Cage. Uh, we'll all be yeah. dead in the future. You know, it's okay. Just run the debt forever. We'll all be yeah, dead you know anyway. There's a, there's a term for that. I didn't know this. Is the uh, it's called IBG, UB, YBG. I'll be gone. You'll be gone. <laughs> Oh you know, when I first learned that from, remember Larry O'Brien, the guy we used to know. Was, yeah, the, yeah. When it comes to me now. Yeah. And that's, that, there's actually IBG, YBG. I'll be gone, you'll be gone. So they really don't care when it blows up. I'll, they, I'll be long gone. So, um, and, you know, even to this day, I you know, I think they find John Stump, who was the CEO. I couldn't believe he sold like $90 million or $60 million in options before, you know, they reported that whole $3 million. Uh, $3 million customer fraud, you know, and he sold, you know, 30, 40, 50 million dollars in options, you know, right. Now, who is he? Give us some background on him. He, he was the, he was the former CEO of Wells Fraud, of Wells Fargo. Excuse okay. Me. Yeah, yeah. And, and the whole thing, and I went into, I went into, and it was clear as day, because if you go on Yahoo, whatever, well, they still have it, and you can see the insider seller. Yeah. So like, like a month or 30 days before, or 60 days before, they had a Wells Fargo opened up his kimono, kimono and said, yeah, we did these bad things. So I'm <laughs> unloaded a whole bunch of, of his shares. Over and over and over and over and over and over. And, you know, take him into bankruptcy and, and buy him out of bankruptcy. Own the law firm that does all the legal the work. make a fortune, yeah. Oh, yeah. And then take them public, right? And then Dumb bankrupt public, yeah. them again and sell them to all the retirement uh, pension plans across the country across north america and, and do it again yeah. and do it again and again, do it again and again, and again. And fees yeah. and fees and fees and fees and there was like one ep energy which yeah. was done uh, yeah i don't know if you knew they were they were in texas they were part of the old um kinder morgan what kinder pipeline yeah mm. the, the big a huge pipeline company was part of enron I got, uh, oh yeah yeah okay and that's what they did, you know, that Apollo Access Industries, which are two giant private equity firms, you know, they took it over in a leverage buyout, loaded up with debt and, uh, with pick notes, which are, you know, you know what a pick note is, James? Yes, but go ahead. Payment in kind, you know, it's like a promise to pay nothing. Yeah. Load up with pick notes, <laughs> pull all their money out and the dividend. Yeah, okay. capital gains. <laughs> Bring it public. Yeah, get paid Throw again. Bankruptcy. Yeah, yeah. get paid yeah, again. So. Get paid to short them on the way to bankruptcy. And, it, and, the, and the funny thing when you start looking at it, it's a it's a pattern. Do you follow me? Yeah, it's the same thing over and over again. That's I mean, you're looking at this. There's not a lot of plays. You know, bring it public. Merge. You know, roll. Do a roll up. Combine with a lot of other companies. Sell it to a greater pool, a bigger entity, merge it with that, or bring it public, so the retail investors own it. So it's just so what I'm saying. What we're doing here with life insurance and annuities and so forth, we're actually we're protecting people's principal. We're insulating them for all this crap. And if you want to invest in some of this stuff, fine, be my guest, okay? But I just tell people, James, just give me the money you don't want to lose. Oh, there you go. <laughs> You know? How much is that? Oh, probably most of it. I don't you know. You know, because yes, a lot of people, but some people, you know, I, I had a client in here. That, that, you know, he, I had a good amount of money. He doesn't, he just inherited a, a good chunk, you know, from a, and he said, yeah, I think I'm keeping the market. But he, you know, we, but we designed his retirement the whole thing, most of it. You know, luckily I get the line share. But if people want to do that, I have no problem with it. They want to gamble with it, fine. Sure. Right. But let's 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 take care of your retirement. Let's take care of you know your children, your grandchildren. Uh, you know, let's, you know, make sure in case you get sued or you, you know, you get sick or whatever, you're protecting this stuff. Let's, let's get that fun. Well, let's get, and if you want to do it, fine. Yeah. You know, I, you know, I, you and I are kind of where, you know, we're small business people. We, we, I put a lot of money in stuff where it hasn't panned out. But, yeah. You know, yeah. You know, I agree with that. It's like, um, you know, you can lose all the money you want. All right. It's pretty easy to lose money. You know the challenge is keeping money, right? Yeah, and that yeah, and that's what I find with even really wealthy people. They don't, you know, they, they don't want to lose it once they have it. Right. Well, yeah, it takes too long to put it together. And uh, but I, I'm with you. You know, it's uh, let's let's take care of some basics, some fundamentals. You know, um, income, liquidity, healthcare. You know, legacy, and everybody's different. You know, not everybody has grandchildren, or not everybody has causes that they love and wish to support beyond their lifetime. But um, 
nobody wants to die broke right yeah and I, you know and the whole thing is really it's um there's some Indian f- phrase you know whatever but it's not what you do for this generation for the next generation and um it, you only, you only get to keep what you give away you know um but I think you know we, I think it's just it's just is common sense um in the Judeo uh, tradition whatever and you know one of my biggest uh Fans recently is a rabbi out of Chicago, okay, and you know, and uh, it's really so. What we're just trying to do is just help everybody, you know. And uh, I don't care whether black, white, you know, yeah, Jewish, Catholic, Protestant. I don't care, you know. Oh, don't leave the Irish and the Scots out, man. Come on. <clears throat> so uh, I mean, that, that's me, man. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, the uh, rabbi in Chicago is he like a household name? Written several books or. Yeah, actually, he's actually a guy by the name of Evan Moffick, and uh, he's a, actually a best. He went to Stanford, and uh, he's actually a best-selling author. And he, um, one of his specialties is um, he's trying to bridge the uh, the bridge between Christianity and Judaism and stuff like that, which is good. Yeah, we're all, you know, we all came from the. I think we all came from the, you know, the the uh, the Middle East at some point. Everybody did at some point, but uh, so he's just. Um, and uh, d- just a good guy. And he said, one of the things is you got to give people hope. And yeah. that's what, which I, I think which we have to do. Mm-hmm. That's well, the hard yeah. thing. To do. I think there really is hope. I mean, as, as uh, poorly run as it is and uh, all of the nefarious things that are going on, this is still the greatest country in the world that I'm aware of, that the greatest government that's ever been put together by man. Um, with all of its warts and problems, you know, what's the alternative? Right? Where yeah, else do you want to go? Than, I'd rather be here than in Mexico. You know? Sure. Or Australia. Uh, or, you know, or, uh, you know, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, yeah, there's, there's still so much you can do. But the thing is, is that w- w- which we're unfortunately we're becoming a third world country in many respects. Yeah. You know, which, which is, uh, and, you know, we're talking about COVID. Let's hey, let's talk about the drug problem. I mean, ninety three thousand people died last year with opioid addiction. I mean, that's more people than the entire Vietnam War. Yeah. One year. Yeah, I, I don't know, know how it is in Texas, but up over here in New Hampshire, we're we've had, we've had a lot of opioid deaths around here, and I've seen it happen close to my family. You know, some of my uh, my children's uh, uh, kids have you know overdosed, and it's it's tragic. I tell you what, my my family and I we just returned from a little vacation. We were gone for a week, and we went through New Orleans on our way to Florida. And I'd never been to New Orleans, right? And I love France, and I love architecture, and I love history. And uh, but we stayed a couple of nights in New Orleans, and um, you know I was a little bit shocked. I shouldn't be surprised. I mean, uh, we had fun, and you know enjoyed the beignets and. You yeah, know, took a tour totally. and all the architecture, um, but my gosh, that town! You know, I was quite disappointed that that town has—they've uh, let it uh, just, you know, uh, turn into what it is. I mean, if I had anything to do with that town, I'd have—I'd bleach it seriously for about a week, you know, and have street cleaners out there twenty-four hours a day. But that's me. But I'm saying all that to say this, that on the tour, we're going around, a fabulous tour, fabulous town, you know, besides the cleanliness and uh, and some of the people. We, I mean, we'd seen literally on this tour bus right here on the sidewalks driving by couples out here doing drugs live right there on the on the sidewalk, seen a young man standing beside a scooter and, and was almost in a in a like an epileptic seizure, but it wasn't. He was, you know, some kind of drug overdose. Um, so I'm not really aware. I'm not up to date on the opioid problem um, here in Texas, but that was so heartbreaking and sad looking at that, seeing that just right out in the general public, like it goes on every day there. Nobody, people walking up and down the street and the sidewalks and it was like nobody cared, gave it a second thought or a second look. Uh, and you know, without hope, when I mean, we have this COVID and you know the lockdown of societies and businesses, you know that does destroy hope. It, you know, it sure doesn't help, right? 
And then the stress that it causes, you know, the suicides. I understand suicides are up across a lot of different ages. Oh, yeah. It's, it, it, it's, it's, America is, you know, and, and you start looking at the statistics, okay? If you want to live a long life, you're better off in Japan or Switzerland or something like that because of all these problems. Now. Actually, our mortality, James, is actually uh, a life expectancy has gone down two years in a row. I think. You know, this is a first generation that's not going to yeah, outlive. Exactly doesn't have going down. Yes, uh, and then if you think about you know the the just the situation of uh, health in general in America, you know the healthcare the way it is, and you know health and you know what are the what are the causes of bad health and disease? You know a lot of it is stress. Where where does stress come from? What is the greatest stressor in the American family? Typically, money. You know. Uh, so I'm not saying that money is the uh, end all be all, but, um, you know, you got to have hope. It costs money to live. It costs money to enjoy retirement and you shouldn't abdicate your responsibility to Wall Street or any other financial guru. You know, I think that I encourage people to do their homework and, uh, and, and just think through the whole process of capital and capital accumulation, protecting your capital and enjoying your capital for the rest of your life, however you choose to do that. And then maybe even helping the next generation with some capital. And you're not really going to get that from uh, hedge funds and Wall Street gurus, in my opinion. No, kind it's... Of- um- uh, I, there's actually there's, there's a uh, great book I was thinking about uh, putting a chapter in the book called Devil Take the Hindmost yep. and um, it, a wonderful book for uh, by Edward Ch- uh, Chancellor and he actually researches the history of bubbles and um, a, the thing is, is what's at the root of it is essentially the devil take the hindmost is like I'll take care of myself let me maximize my stuff I don't care give a hoot about anyone else. Yeah. And that is so, it's such selfishness and so pervasive yeah. in this country. It's, it's hard to believe. And when you look at like um, the best, like run pension systems. Okay. In, in the, in the, uh, in, in the world, the reason why we're so selfish um, is that that's why we're 18 and, and, and out of the top 20 in the world league tables. We're next to Malaysia, you know, and you know, when you look at the, and not, I'm not saying uh, we're a big con- country, so there's a lot of things we have to, uh, but there's no, um, because of the greed. And I mean, I think there's 5% of the population owns all the wealth, you know, but anyhow, but the, I, I think really there was the, the one of the reasons why the Dutch system and uh, is so good. Is there's, there's actually some sense of risk sharing. And it's not like, Hey, we're going to throw you into this target date fund. I don't know what it's going to do. Okay. Okay, and and the funny thing is, is that I was just I I have some pretty big executives and uh, or clients, and I was discussing this with one executive, one a very very big public company, and uh, she's luckily she's um, she has all these legacy benefits and things like that, and I was explaining all this stuff. She says, "Yeah, I know it's horrible now for these younger people." Yeah, a target date fund with indexing, and that's the whole thing. Michael Green is the guy you want to watch, but anyway, so I'm interviewing him at some point, but. He explains all the problems of indexing. There's no accountability and all the uh, risk. And so all this indexing thing like Wall Street is it, just overblown. So again, protection of principle should be more important to people than ever, particularly with using life insurance and annuity products because indexing, they guarantee nothing. Uh, well, you, know? you can go right past zero on Wall Street. Uh, so zero is not the floor. Yeah, zero so, is not the floor on Wall Street. So, but, but one of the reasons why I'm updating this book too, James, is that in, uh, but so what happened is all the, the you know, the major private uh, asset managers, BlackRock, Vanguard, um, of all getting into the private equity space, leverage buyout space. But what, what really pushed me to update this book was in, in June of 2000, about, about 13 months ago, the Department of Labor gave uh, private equity its, uh, its blessing to be uh, in, in, in target date funds. Ah. Okay, so so they, they get and they get their nose underneath the tent. You know, the elephant got the nose underneath the tent. Yeah. And um, so what convinced me to do this further, and luckily I was able to get to know Jack Bogle, the guy founder of uh, yep. BlackRock before he died. Um, and he must be rolling, but in Vanguard, uh, February, right. Vanguard, yeah. 
which is actually that old Wellington company, but that's another story. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Um, but Jack Bogle, he actually endorsed the last book and uh, uh, he liked it. Though, you know, I didn't guarantee income, but, uh, but, and, um, and people don't believe me, uh, Google it, please. Uh, uh, February of 2021, Vanguard uh, uh, came out with a white paper saying why and we're getting into private equity, why we think it's great for our clients. And they're looking primarily for the large high end net worth people, but, but so that happened then in uh, June of this year, um, there's a bipartisan effort to offer private equity into uh, for retail investors, repeal the um, uh, uh, registered advisor, you know, the, uh, you know, the high net worth people, which traditionally is going to be in it. So they want to say, um, accredited investors. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Accredited investors. Excuse me. I forget that. And I still have to know what, but anyway, so, so we want to give, make private equity available to everyone. You know, so, 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 uh, look, there's 600 and or 6,600 firms out there. There's a lot of business. They got to spread the wealth. <laughs> so, yeah, so they want to, they're going after the retirement funds, entire uh, IRAs. And so, and, and so the whole thing is the target date funds, um, uh, uh, according to really associate, they, they essentially get about 53% of all new deposits going in by 2023. They estimate 80%. Wow. Going to target date funds. So people's money is really being hijacked. They don't even have, don't even understand what's going on. So specifically, whenever um, an employee goes to work and they are enrolling in their benefits, so you have to opt out of the 401k. You have to opt out of it. Matter of fact, there's acceleration clauses in it as well. Yeah. Used to, you had to opt in. Now you have to opt out. Opt out. And automatically, by default, are these target date funds. Right. Yeah, which no one can understand. Yeah. So, uh, how convenient? How convenient? Well, the, 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 the government's letting, letting them play God. I mean, I don't know what I'm having for dinner tonight. Never mind what's going to happen next week or yeah. five years or ten years now. We we don't know. Yeah, the future. We, we know, anyone know that COVID was coming? Okay, so yes, actually, I think some people did actually know COVID was coming. The guys who created it. I'm just saying. <laughs> the guys who created, it, but, but my point is that we don't know. What's no, we don't. We, yeah, just, we don't. we just don't. Okay, yeah. and so, but this is what's with Wall Street and the asset management, and it's not just in the U.S. By the way, it's, it's the same thing. I remember one time I was, I was speaking at a conference somewhere, and there was a guy there from Belgium who says, "Oh yeah, we have, I have this. We have the same thing, kind of what you're talking about in Belgium too." Yeah. So we, so a lot of this private equity stuff, which, you know, it's in, it's in the UK, it's in Sweden, it's in France, it's in Germany, not as much because, because their whole, like the Germans, they have seem to have a more saner view of savings and things like that. And then mm-hmm. um, they hate stocks for the most part. In Germany? Yeah. The Germans, yeah, they put a roughly 80% of their money, 85% of their money into safe stuff. Hmm. They think mutual funds and stocks are gambling, which is, which is right. It is. That's not savings. There's a complete difference between savings and investing. And investing today is it's more akin to gambling, right? I mean, what is the difference between Wall Street and Las Vegas? Well, at least when you go to Vegas, you have fun. Right. Right. Well, maybe, one's in the desert, a few, right? A few drinks and a free meal out of it, I guess. <laughs> right. So your new book, when when do you expect to have it out and published? It's going to be out in this fall. I've been working on it diligently. It's going to be go guaranteed income 2.0. People, if they want to go to barryjamesdyke.com right now, they get they get the other books. Pirates of Manhattan, one which still sells. It still sells all around the world. And, it should. Uh, it should. And, Outstanding. And, and then Pirates of Manhattan 2, Highway to Surfing, which is about target date funds, which we're talking about. Mm-hmm. And, um, and then guaranteed income. So... Uh, people still, you know, buy it today. I don't know where where it's coming from, but uh, people still buy all of them today. And uh, it's coming from guys like me, Barry, telling people you need to read these, you need to read these, and then giving them a great big discount for, to purchase them. But you know, I know a lot of people don't like to read or are busy. You know, yeah, that, that's read. a problem. That's a real problem, I know, James. If you find it, do people really read anymore? Uh, yeah, they do, but um, not as much as you would wish and not as much as you know we did historically in my opinion so that just means Barry you have an opportunity to put all your your books on audio right yeah I'll do that probably doing ebooks and the whole thing but uh, I'll let my children kind of get into that because they're more tech savvy than I am I'm just a good researcher I'm just persistent 
Right. You know, uh, the, the kids know more about this stuff. Right. So this fall, did you say? Is that what? I yeah, heard? it's gonna. Yeah, it's gonna be done. Yeah, because the the movies the movie is gonna be technically released, I believe, to the Motion Picture Bureau in September. On September twenty third, I think, and then I think the movie is gonna be technically released in Utah around October 9th or something like that. That's all I know about that. It's a, uh, but the guy Doug Orchard, he, he's a he's a great guy, very very knowledgeable guy. Um, um, uh, actually, brilliant guy. He, he's like fifty two, but he looks like he's like a thirty two year old surfer, you know. Wow. And uh, uh, he did he filmed up here, but he uh, came up here and. Uh, and a whirlwind and uh but he's very very knowledgeable and and he gets it now he the funny thing about him is that uh he said you know before he did the movie he, he thought negatively about life insurance and annuities and all that type of thing mm-hmm. now he said you said barry said, now i'm trying to figure out how to get myself two three million dollars annuity for me and my wife so we can retire yeah right. so here's a guy who was totally negative but he's obviously a very 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 smart guy sure okay and, and his young and one of his oldest sons is actually getting his doctorate at 27 and he's working for the fed. Um, so he very, very gets concepts and the whole thing like that. So, um, so, but, and this is, but th- what this movie will show is that this is what most economists think. The big problem James, as you know, is the interest rates is that, um, uh, which is, which it was, you know, the, these problems are caused by the federal reserve. Yeah. Artificially low 6,000 years recorded history, never been lower. So you got to get a return somewhere. Look at all this opportunity on Wall Street, creating opportunity, and it's supposed to attract capital, which is bass backwards. King Lake Capital and capital attracts opportunity. <clears throat> Nelson Nash. Um, <clears throat> so is your book going to be released before the movie? Uh, probably around that. It, it's it's um, it's uh, more work than I anticipated it was going to be um, because I thought I would just be able to just tweak it because I read it over and I said, gee, this is a pretty good book. Yeah, and I said she was no. We could talk <laughs> about things like SPACs and uh, um, and uh, a special purpose acquisition companies, which are, believe it or not, are actually just a repetition of the 1920s. They call them blind pools, but now this is how these companies like Robinhood and all these other companies are going public uh, by bypassing the traditional IPO process. And uh, so um, a, a lot of stuff. And then then the the, the the de-risking by major corporations it just had to be addressed. You know, you know, and, um, you know, you know, why are these companies like International Paper and uh, Phillips Petroleum and Siemens and all these giant companies buying annuities? Mm-hmm. And um, so we just dug at it. And, uh, and you know, so it's just, uh, cause I'm, I'm a doubting Thomas, James. I, you show me. Yeah. I mean, I'm a very visual, whatever, show me. So that's the reason. So since I wrote the last book in 2015, when it was published, um, there's been so much more new information on that, which is not in, was not in the general domain. Yep. Well, I know that we talked uh, over the you know last several months, year or so, and you know I'm waiting. I'm, I've got nothing but encouragement for you. Get it, get it done, sir. Get it published. Get yeah, it out to the public. It's, it's hard though. It's just something. It's just uh, yeah. But you're Barry Dyke. You can do it. So <laughs> <laughs> well. All right, so your book's going to be out about the same time. There's going to be a big yeah, movie well, release. I'll let you know when it's, 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 it's available. It'll, it'll, it'll help. It's going to benefit, um, obviously, me, you know, and uh, but um, and people like yourself. But it's going to really benefit, you know, um, um, because we have to be selfish. And, um, but it's going to uh, benefit the consumers. Sure. Um, really, most, that's most of it. Yeah, and there's a lot of guys. I don't, I don't know if you know Stan, uh, Stan Haithcock, Stan the annuity man. Yeah, my, yeah I don't know oh, him. Very, very bright guy. Yeah. Very, very bright guy. He used to work for uh, all the end. Um, this is a lot of guys just speaking the truth, and uh, it'll, it'll help a lot of guys like that. Uh, but more importantly, the consumers. Yeah, sure. You know, because, you know, I I, I had essentially been the past 24 months, I had one client of mine put over like 2.2 million to annuities, okay? And, you know, he's, he's happy as a clam. You know, and uh, me and Harry and a bunch of them, I think we're just going to keep in the market. That's fine. But all everything is all taken care of. Yeah. You know, and he can retire and do what he wants, you know. You know, and so, um, and, and and so, but most people don't have that kind of money. So I, I want to have the, the regular old guy just have a little peace of mind in retirement account. Yeah. You know. Yep. <clears throat> I, uh, I, I've got nothing but encouragement for you, sir. 
And I think people should, the general public, you know, the uh, all American individual, the listener, you should educate yourself. You have an opportunity, you know, to uh, to discover Barry Dock's work if you are unfamiliar with it. And even though there's a fourth book coming and a movie coming that we're excited to uh, see when they are released, the three books that he has available right now are worth reading. They're worth your investigation. Yeah, they, they, yeah. I read when I read over them. I was like, oh, I read, wrote that, you know. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> this is pretty good stuff. So, um, uh, but you know, it's the uh, so yeah. So when then yeah, so just the, the people will be better off, and, and uh, um, anything worthwhile takes some effort. But All right. <clears throat> All right, Barry, Doc, any uh, any closing points or comments, ideas, thoughts that you want to share with us? Yeah, but this, you know, you know uh, no, just, you know, just keep going, you know, one day at a time, you know, and, uh, and read and, and read history, you know, mm -hmm. history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. That's for sure. It sure does. Yeah. And, um, and uh, yeah, because it's not just about you or me, uh, um, but it's about our children and our grandchildren, you know, and, you know, my father always taught me that, you know, you're supposed to leave something better than the way you found it. Right. And that's still a part of my life today. Yeah. That's the way I grew up. Even in, you know, a hotel, if you're staying in a hotel somewhere, clean it up, you know, and I'm not saying, you know, take over the room service, but, you know, turn the lights out and just be a, a steward of, of everything. You know, you should leave things better than you found them. And, and it's okay to do that. And it's worthy. It's noble. It's, it's good for you to do that. So I completely agree. That's the way I grew up. And, uh, that's, I, I believe that to this day. So, you know, as much as, <clears throat> you know, you and I get compensated for what we do, you know, just like any other worker, you know, worker is, is, uh, worthy of his hire, right? So we should all get paid to do what we do. Um, but at the end of the day, our clients benefit much more than we do from our work. Exactly. Exactly. You know, it's, it, exactly. And it's just, uh, you know, uh, you know, I've, I've had some, you know, I've had a lot of, you know, cause I've done been in the business a long time. I've had a lot of, uh, I've had a lot of life claims, yeah. 63 of them. I count them all up, you know, and some of them, a lot of them in small, but some of them are pretty big. Yeah. And um, I bet most of them were life changing for the people that were left behind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's, it's funny. Yeah, and it's it's always been the the families were better off because of the work we did. Yeah, you know, and um, that that in itself is uh, makes it all worth it. Yep, I agree. I agree. All right, Barry. Well, thank you. I mean, I hate to, you know, monopolize your time, but I always enjoy speaking with you and visiting when we have the opportunity. And I appreciate you coming on and sharing with us. So thank you. My pleasure, James. Always a pleasure seeing see my friend James Nethery. God right. bless you. Keep up your keep pushing back the frontiers of ignorance. Yes, sir. Um, doing my part. All right, have a good right. rest of your day, Barry. Thank you again. Take care. Bye bye. Right. Bye bye. Thank you for joining us on the Banking with Life podcast. If you're watching on YouTube, make sure to like and subscribe and click on that little notification bell. Otherwise, join us on Apple Podcasts and Stitcher for weekly content.